What I'd like to do now is finish off the discussion of intents. We have two more parts of this, and then in the time that is remaining, we'll begin to talk about activities. And by the time we cover activities, which we will, probably won't get done entirely today, uh, but we'll certainly get done by next Monday, at that point, you'll be in a good position to do all the, the assignment for assignment number three. So if you recall, for intents, we talked about the purposes that intents served, and we talked about two different types of things that intents are used for. They're used to express actions, to perform, and events that have occurred. So those are the two different types of things that uh, intents are used for. We talked about the structure of intents. We talked about explicit intents, where the names are provided. We talked about so-called implicit intents, where you provide various descriptions of things like actions, data, or categories, and so on. And then we talked about how the Android runtime system figures out what components handle those kinds of intents. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So we're going to talk about so-called intent resolution. So intent resolution is the process of how the Android runtime system and framework matches up the intents that are created with the handlers of those intents, the components that handle the intents. And there's a couple of different steps that are involved here. Uh, it starts out, and this goes back to your question from before. You have some activity, which might actually be the launcher. Um, create an intent and then say start activity so that the intent, whatever it is, is passed to the start activity method. And that then goes ahead and uses something called the Activity Manager service to perform intent resolution. And it uses the Android Activity Manager service, which we'll talk a lot about in the course because it's one of the core system services that is available in Android, to take a look at all the various different kinds of components that have been registered with the system. And these registrations typically occur when an application is downloaded from the Play Store and parsed its package is parsed by the so-called package manager. And that populates some internal data structures that Android uses in order to be able to figure out what handles what types of intents. And so based on what it discovers, it then goes ahead and activates an activity, a second activity, and then starts to perform lifecycle activities on it. For example, <coughs> calling its onCreateHook method to, to do something. And you can learn more about how all these different things work here. Intent filters describe which intents a component can handle. And these are really the things that are used in order for the system to figure out who is going to handle the intents that were generated by somebody, which is typically another application or another activity in the, in the system, which might be a system activity such as the launcher. These are usually specified in an Android manifest file. And uh, we'll take a look at the contents of this in more detail later. But basically, the manifest files are what's called metadata. Metadata is data about data. And they describe the components that are provided by an application in Android. And every application in Android has an Android manifest file, which explains the components that it exports to the outside world, as well as other kinds of things as well, like permissions it needs, and versions of the Android uh, development kit, the SDK, and so on that it uses. And we'll see lots and lots of examples of this later. So here's a very simple example from the email application, which comes by default with Android. And you can see that this particular manifest file, of which I've just extracted a subset, goes ahead and uh, describes the filters for the activity that composes messages. <laughs> so on Android, if you open your email application and you hit the funny little icon that means compose, then that's going to generate an intent that's going to start an activity that knows how to compose an email message. And here's the actual part of the code that, that is describing that it's the thing that knows how to handle this. So what happens here is this particular application is registering itself to say, I want to handle action send intents with any type of data. The data could be um, various kinds of things as, as long as it says something like mail to colon blah, blah, blah. So anything that has that type of uh, a, um, an intent will be 
handled by this particular activity. Yes? Yes, so the question here is, in the email application, what do the different activities look like? There are lots and lots and lots of activities okay, so they're, they're in the email client. So you can also specify this type of information programmatically in your application. So for example, here's a, a somewhat fabricated example that uh, is going to have a broadcast receiver, which is a component we'll talk about later. And this broadcast receiver is going to register to handle action send intents for any type of data. Um, the main difference between this type of configuration and this type of configuration is this type of configuration does not require the activity to be up and running in order for the Android Intense Framework, an activity manager service, to route intents to this particular activity. That activity can be launched uh, on demand. It does not have to be running. In contrast, this type of a model requires the application to be up and running and waiting to receive intents. So it's a slightly different way of doing things. Both of them are useful. We'll talk largely for the time being about statically configured intent handlers that use manifest files because that's the place to start, and that's what your assignment three does. But you have to be aware you can also dynamically register these things as well. Okay, now the, fil the fields in the filter parallel the fields in the intent. So what this is saying here is that this particular filter has an action that's action send. It has data that's basically a MIME type for any type of data, and it's the default category. And an implicit intent, in other words, an intent that's created with no name attached to it, will be tested against the filter in all of these areas. And they all have to pass in order for this activity to be considered a candidate for handling the intent. And we'll see later that there actually could be multiple candidates for handling an intent. And uh, if there are, there's a way that Android lets you help to disambiguate which one to choose. The extras and the flags we talked about don't play any part whatsoever in resolving which component receives an intent. It's just these three fields that are used. Now, components can have more than one intent filter. So here's another example. This is from the message compose activity that Android defines. So this particular activity both responds to action send uh, actions or intents that have the action send uh, action as well as those that have send multiple. And uh, so in that case, you could, when you send multiple, um, that indicates that you have multiple people who are going to be uh, receiving this particular information as opposed to just one. So this handles send action with any data and handles the send multiple action with any data. And each of these filters describes the intents the component is willing to receive. And when you take a look at the real file, if you go back and look at the email, you see that there's lots and lots and lots of other filters in there as well. So now when an intent actually gets sent out, then it's up to the Android Activity Manager service to figure out which things actually match. So here's an example where we send an action with a URI, which is being sent to a particular uh, person in this case. And that intent is going to match against this. But an action view, which might be used to view an image, isn't going to match. So of course, the message compose activity isn't going to be picked to view an image, whereas the action send would match against this. So that's part of how the Android system does its disambiguation. If you were to give a specific name, like email handler, if that was the name of some activity, then it wouldn't use any of these intent filtering operations. It would simply look to find who implemented the, event, the email handler and then would go ahead and route the message to it if, if it had existed, if it had been described and defined and configured into the system. So your next assignment will use implicit event handling, but be aware you can also do explicit handling too. Now here's the interesting case. There are situations where multiple component intent filters may match a given intent. And uh, that 
happens under a variety of different circumstances. For example, the Maps application that we're going to look at here later, probably, probably uh, Monday, will send an intent out. And if there, mul there may be multiple ways of being able to view the intent. The intent in this particular case is going to be trying to uh, map an address. And there may be a um, like Google Maps app that knows how to do that. There may also be a browser that knows how to do this as well. And so if there's options to choose from, then Android throws up a little dialog box and gives you, the user, the opportunity to select which one you want, which application you want to run that intent. So here's an example where you're trying to play some kind of video and uh, it says you can either try to play this in YouTube or you can play it in Chrome, the Chrome browser, and uh, you can select which one you want and then you can say, I just want this thing to be done once and so it'll just, every time henceforth it'll ask you again or you can say, I want to choose this particular activity to handle it every time, in which case it won't prompt you again unless you go and make some changes in the, the phone settings to make it um, reset. Okay, so that's basically intent resolution in a nutshell. You'll need to understand at least portions of intent resolution in order to do assignment number three. And we'll show some examples later to make it more clear. The last piece of this particular slide set talks just briefly about how intents relate to concurrency. And because that's a key theme that we're going to cover many times over through the course. It turns out that intents are actually not inherently related to concurrency. So you can end up having target components, target components here being other activities, services, broadcast receivers, which may or may not run concurrently with respect to the client that starts them up. So if you start an activity, start a service, send to a, a broadcast receiver, they may or may not run concurrently. However, if the component that you're starting with your intent is going to block and or run for an extended period of time, then you need to make sure things run concurrently. And we'll look at some examples here later, and you'll also get a chance to do this for your next assignment. So for things that take a while to run, where a while, as we'll see, is defined as basically more than three to five seconds, then you need to do concurrent things. Android provides something called an intent service, which is a real cool reusable component that automates starting up services to process intents running in a background thread. And we'll talk about them later on in the course. Real cool, real easy. In fact, we'll probably have a programming assignment where you can write the intent service version of your assignment number three. It'll probably be assignment number four. There are also other things that you can use to process various kinds of components concurrently, which you'll get a chance to do in assignment number three. So you can use the Android Hammer framework, you can use the Android Async Task framework, sometimes you can spawn Java threads in conjunction with the Hammer framework and so on and so forth if you need things to run concurrently. 